Well, to get started, I, I would assume that by now and also by the you know first unofficial check-in that we had um, at the very beginning where you shared with us why you're here, most of us sort of know what Bildung is, but the, the question for this conference is really, well, how, how do we actually do it? How is this done? And what are the initiatives that are already out there and that have been out there for a long time that we can learn from, that we can build upon? And in order to bring this idea of Bildung to life, we decided to set up the presentations for today in the form of a timeline that gives us a sense of how Bildung has evolved over the ages. And that will create a deeper insight into how Bildung has been and is practically applied. So the first uh, you know, of our timeline is really starting all the way back with Comenius. Um, as Leonard joked in our pre-meeting, he sends his regards, he couldn't make it, hasn't been around for a long time, but I actually believe that he would have been truly delighted to be here and sort of know what has come of, of also his ideas. Then we'll move on to talk about Weimar and Jena and the movements that emerged about 200 years later. And then, of course, we'll also talk about Chao Takwa, which first surfaced around the same time as the, the Nordic folk building. And we'll hear about study circles in Norway, followed by other current initiatives that happen in Amsterdam and Finland and in the Ukraine. And in terms of what will happen now for the next few hours is I will give you a very short intro for each speaker. And there's obviously more info to be found online and their links if you want to dive deeper into their body of work, because uh, Lena and Meta have uh, collected all of these very illustrious people. So, you know, is going through all of their um, CVs on, online before and thinking, OK, how do I keep this short? So please educate yourself about them more. Um, each speaker then has eight minutes to give us some essentials, right? So eight minutes is obviously not very long. So they really give us a sort of a crystalline version of what they're going to talk about, what they're busy with right now, um, what the initiatives are that they want to present or the, the history that they want to present. And after each speech, you'll have about 30 seconds to write down one or two things that you've taken away from this particular presentation. Okay. Well, then, you know, this is the drum roll moment because it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today, Zachary Stein. Zach studied philosophy and religion, educational neuroscience, human development, and the philosophy of education. And his second book investigates the relations between schooling and technology. And today, Zach will introduce us to John Amos Comenius, one of the founding fathers of the modern notion of Bildung. So, Zach, it is my pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, and it's, it's my pleasure to be here, really. I am tremendously honored and kind of acutely aware of being an American speaking in English at a European Bildung Day conference. So I just um, kind of, uh, and then also acutely aware of just my intense admiration for John Amos Comenius. Um, almost like a saintly figure, I believe, in the history of education. If there were an educator's hall of fame, like there's a baseball hall of fame or something, you'd have, you know, exhibits on John Dewey and exhibits on Montessori, but you'd have probably like a statue out front of Comenius. This would be my sense. I think uh, the stature of his work and the scope of the vision have yet to be fully appreciated um, with the exception of only a few uh, scholars uh, in Czech, this is my belief. Now, this wasn't true back in the day. Uh, Goethe, Herder were tremendously influenced by Comenius's work. Uh, there's a large unpublished manuscript by René Descartes on Comenius's pan Sophie, which was his vision of universal wisdom. It's said, but it's a rumor <clears throat> that it was Comenius in his meeting with Descartes that got Descartes to publish the meditations. Um, Wilhelm Leibniz was also a very uh, um, great admirer of Comenius's work. Um, and it's suspected that his notion of the perennial philosophy, which was a kind of trans religious um, vision um, uh, was also taken more or less from Comenius now. 
I was a philosopher of education. I never heard of communion. <laughs> he was never spoken about in any of my courses in the philosophy of education on the history of educational reform. This is curious. I discovered Comenius when I was studying uh, the end of the long 16th century um, and the transition out of the feudal empire and into what we know as the modern state. And I was reading a book by uh, Francis Yates on the Rosicrucian enlightenment. And it was there that I discovered Comenius. Um, and then I found that there was actually uh, a vast treasure trove of remarkable work that was done, um, which I believe was a path not taken towards this thing what, that we call modernity. Understand that the end of the long 16th century was a time between worlds, similar to the one that we're living in now. Uh, the end of the divine right of kings, the end of the feudal way of organizing economics and legitimate power, the emergence of things like the Dutch East India Company, who Comenius dedicated one of his books to, uh, and the beginning of uh, natural science as a hegemonic discourse, the emergence of democracy and things that we now call nation states, all of that was taking place. Comenius was fleeing the violence, literally fleeing the violence. His people were fleeing the violence in Bohemia uh, from the Thirty Years' War. He became a pilgrim um, and undertook tremendous efforts at educational reform throughout Europe, while at the same time articulating a unified, dare I say, integral philosophy of all things and a universal vision of the reform of all things literally, like politics, religion, education. It's, it's a remarkable vision. Um, <clears throat> so he gave us things that we now take for granted. Um, the idea that everyone should be educated, men, women, disabled people, people of all races, people of all religious creeds. Comenius gave us this idea. The idea that you shouldn't beat kids, that beating kids is a bad idea. Uh, Comenius gave us this idea. <laughs> uh, he also gave us the notion that you should teach things from the simple to the abstract, that there are age specific ways of teaching. And he gave us a notion of lifelong learning, which is actually deeply profound. He believed that there was a school for every age of life, a school of infancy, which was about the mother. So he identified the family and specifically the mother as the first root of education. Then there's a school for childhood, a school for adolescence, schools for adults. And then most interestingly, he had the school uh, of death and the school of death was for uh, those people who were aged, the elders. And he suggested that they remove themselves from the flow of normal life and study religious topics. Um, so we had this whole vision <laughs> of an entire life course uh, helped by educational institutions uh, along the way. Now, he's the root of Bill Dung, and this is Bill Dung, and this is obvious uh, in part. And it's important to note the religious root here. Like people want to assimilate, Jean Piaget in particular and others wanted to assimilate Comenius to the cause of secular education and compare him to John Dewey and the likes. Can't do that. <laughs> Comenius was a thoroughgoing religious thinker um, and articulated a profound religious cosmology, which was fairly unprecedented in its scope and its anthropological optimism about the role of the human as a co-creator with the divine in the universe. And so that means that the image of God, that the human is in the image of God, and that the root of the term building is this notion of image. This is the communion notion that in fact, uh, education is a primary function of the human species precisely because the human is the only creature that is invested with the full potentialities of the infinite, right? This was Comenius's view. So therefore do not squander human potential, <laughs> create institutions that allow for the full expression of all human potential, all of it. He used to say, teach all things to all people in all ways. And he meant that very seriously. Um, so I'll wrap on the final point, which was that he was arguably the organizer of this group that was known as the Invisible College, which is sometimes associated with the Rosicrucians, um, which was a group of scholars who during the Thirty Years' War, during this incredibly tumultuous time when propaganda was invented and a whole bunch of things were taking place, uh, <clears throat> 
group of scholars dedicated to uh, what we now think of as the enlightenment ideals of reason and science and democracy. Um, and so that group, this invisible college, uh, Hartlib and Comenius and others eventually would come to form what was known as the Royal Society in 1660 something. This was the primary institution we associate with the beginning of the enlightenment. Now that thing was completely inspired by Comenius but here's what's interesting. They scrubbed it clean of the Comenian religiosity. And so there was a point taken at the origins of modernity where we decided to not go the Comenian route, which was a kind of uh, uh, universalistic uh, kind of new world spirituality, if I can use that term. So it's Comenius's vision of a, of a, of a, of a perennial philosophical approach rooting religious and science and politics in a broadly religious vision. Um, and instead we ended up getting a collaboration between science and the emerging techno-economic base of capitalism in creating this thing called modernity. And many of Comenius's ideas, including what we now think of as large public schools that attempt to serve all citizens, uh, were removed from association with him in part because of his association with the religious and specifically the mystical. And there's more to say about that. So there's a reason we haven't current heard of Comenius and it has to do with the modern allergy to religiosity. But as I say in my book, the only way forward with religion, and I would say building in particular, uh, is to find a way to return to notions of the sacred and to, as, as Habermas would say, um, tap the untapped semantic potential of religious languages, uh, which remain uh, the only available source for certain forms of meaning making that are needed to protect uh, vulnerable groups of people. And I would say children are among those vulnerable, group, vulnerable groups of people. So I could probably speak for 10 hours on Comenius, but I will stop here. Um, and yeah, I'm working on a manuscript now and hope to have that done uh, in the next year. Uh, which will be my characterization of Comenius <clears throat> in light of a whole bunch of contemporary uh, currents of thought, um, including metamodernism and integral theory and other things. So, so thank you again. I'm honored to be able to evoke Comenius here to kind of bring his spirit into the room. And I agree that these efforts would be, you know, applauded by him. And uh, so thank you. Um. Zach, thank you so much for that. And, uh, you know, hearing you talk about Comenius and realizing how little I knew here made me also think of what Lena always sell, says that uh, Bildung also is about knowing your roots. So for the Bildung movement to know its own roots seems very pertinent. So let's take uh, 30 seconds for all of us to reflect on what are we walking away with. Just uh, take a few notes, mute yourselves in the meantime. Okay, so those were our 30 second reflection time. You can do this for yourself, or of course, as some of you have started, just pop them into, into the chat. And with this, it is my pleasure to hand over to Lena Rachel Anderson. And Lena is, of course, the co-author of The Nordic Secret that she wrote together um, with one of our other her very illustrious uh, people here in the room, as you all know. And uh, she's also co-founder of the European Bildung Network. She's president of Nordic Bildung and a member of the Club of Rome. And Lena will share with us how a pastor and a stubborn teacher turned Bildung into folk Bildung for peasants rather than just something for the bourgeoisie. So Lena, I'm handing over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Zach, for a, for a wonderful presentation of Comenius. Uh, so when I uh, researched and wrote The Nordic Secret uh, back in 2015 and 16 and 17, I had actually never heard about Comenius before. And he, you know, entered my uh, awareness through uh, researching this story of beauty and freedom about how Bildung traveled from the German idealist and the German thinkers to the Nordic countries. And the original, uh, as, as I just said, the original meaning of uh, Bildung, the, the build, the image in Bildung that this was referring to was that the individual would shape themselves, form themselves in the image of Christ. And so the first meaning of the word Bildung was in the uh, 17th century uh, during, during the uh, 
pietistic movement where the intense uh, spiritual emotion in Christianity was the, the big new thing. So Christianity wasn't just this societal system anymore. There was this whole idea of personal faith and a personal um, metanoia, a, a, a turning around to Christ. And, and Bildung was used in this religious sense. But with the Enlightenment and the uh, 18th century, so the 1700s, the use of the word building in a religious sense kind of disappears. And by the mid of the century, uh, a new meaning is taken over, is taking over. And that's a secular idea of building, which is that the individual um, has an emotional and moral development that is not necessarily religious, but that is related to their uh, maturity and to their knowledge. And uh, Herder was one of the first people to explore how, uh, actually Rousseau was the first one to explore how the child and then the young adult matures and how they think and behave di uh, differently. And then Herder comes in and connects it to the historical development. And he's not actually very politically correct, so I'm not gonna quote him, but he, uh, he compares uh, the individual or actually the historical movement through the times with the emotional and moral uh, development of the individual from a toddler to an adult. And of course, he was a, a, a Protestant Christian, so uh, he compared the uh, Protestant Christians to the adults um, in that historical development. And uh, after him, uh, or one of his contemporaries was his good uh, buddy, Goethe, uh, who was writing the uh, Bildungsroman, the novel about how you evolve as a, as a person from traveling, coming from one place, traveling to another, uh, learning a, a new culture and then returning home. And when you come home, something has happened to you and that's that's your building. Uh, Schiller then enters and, and writes about it and so does Fichte and uh, Hegel and others, Wilhelm von Humboldt, for instance. But they were mainly writing for uh, a bourgeois sea uh, and the people there, and I guess mostly the men, and in Denmark, there was a pastor named Grundvig who read all of this and he heard about uh, much of this and actually uh, romanticism and the spirit and nature and, and the thinking of the German idealists was, was part of this movement also uh, in Jena and Weimar. And these thoughts traveled to Denmark in 1802 very specifically. And there's a young uh, student of theology named Grundvig and he hears a lecture about this and this spirit in, in nature and spirit in, in a people where people is kept together by a language and a cultural tradition and so forth. And he's fascinated by it, but as a, a devout Christian, he only knows one spirit and that's the Holy Spirit. And I'm not gonna get into his whole theological program about how he connects the German idea of a spirit and a people with a spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit, um, but that is his thinking. And then he realizes over the course of the next 20 to 30 years, that it isn't just the bourgeoisie that needs Bildung, it's really the peasants for two reasons. And one is that uh, this was also a time of great changes. Denmark was getting industrialized as was the rest of Europe and the Nordic countries. But we were late to the indus industrialization in Denmark. And so he realizes that the peasants, they need education and Bildung in order to handle these changes and become good citizens. Um, and it is also among the peasants that the folklore is that would be the spirit of the Danes. He comes up with an idea of a folk high school and nobody understands what he says. Uh, one folk high school is built in 1844. It does not become a huge success because it's too expensive to go there. But there's a stubborn teacher and his name is Kristen Cole. And he starts a school in 1851 and he basically builds it on the ideas of Grundvig and his experiences as a teacher. And what he learned as a teacher was that if he taught the children what they, he was supposed to teach them, they did not pay attention. But if he told them stories, then he captured their imagination and their emotions and they were listening and paying attention. So he started a folk high school for some young farm hands and he started by reading novels to them. And when he got their attention, he started asking questions and he let them ask questions. And that was the first time that anybody had asked those farmhands any questions. And so that was radical. And it became a movement of folk high schools that 
we export it to Norway, Sweden, and Finland, and they're still around. And so is the uh, folk high schools and this whole idea of building in the people. So that was that was my little historical link here. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Lena. So again, let's take uh, 30 seconds for some self-reflection, either write it in the chat or note it down for yourself. The 30 seconds are up. Thank you so much, Lena. And our next speaker is Gretchen Collan. And Gretchen worked for more than 12 years at Lakeside, Chautauqua in Ohio, spreading the ideals of the Chautauqua movement and spurring generosity for the community and she really grew up her entire life with Chautauqua. So Gretchen will introduce us um, to, as the president Theodore Roosevelt once said, the most American thing in America, which is still vibrant today. So Gretchen, over to you. Thank you. As, we tra as travel opens up, uh, I invite you to jump on this flight 1874 with nonstop service to North America. We're gonna land and jump on the Chautauqua Trail, which is a journey across the United States. And the Chautauqua was a cultural and educational movement that rippled across North America, just like Bildung did in Denmark. This fascinated me greatly. My Chautauqua experience took root in the 1940s as my grandpa started going to a Chautauqua every single summer Lifelong learning was just rooted deeply in our family. And so this has taken root. And today, my three daughters experience Chautauqua and lifelong learning as well. I want to fast forward to the fall. I was sitting in a class, and the teacher brought up this concept of building. And I started reading the book and learning more about it. And I was uncovering such similarities to the Chautauqua, the essence of Chautauqua. So I opened up my laptop and I sent an email to the author and I didn't think I'd get a response back. And bing, two days later, Lena wrote back and introduced herself and introduced Bildung to me. It was just fascinating. I was just uh, amazed at the similarities. And so I started sharing these with her and, and joined the North American Bildung uh, group. So thank you, Lena, <laughs> for this introduction. Now we're about to journey back to 1874 in North America. There was a bishop in Akron, Ohio, and a philanthropist that started this movement. They had this concept to take Sunday school teachers away for rest and renewal and learning to take, them, take those concepts back to their churches. John Heil Vincent, the bishop, and Lewis Miller, the philanthropist, landed on Chautauqua Lake. This was a lake in upstate New York that was of beauty and rest. And really, they started this camp community, a place that people could go and uh, experience lifelong learning uh, essence. I want to pause on the word Chautauqua. I'll say it again, Chautauqua. Chautauqua was a word that was rooted in the Iroquois nation. And I'm a firm believer that this was no accident. Chautauqua means two moccasins tied together, which I really think this is how we come together in community. So this word is no accident in the English language of why our movement was named Chautauqua. So two moccasins tied together. The movement started spreading across the United States and Canada because during this time in 1874, there was a depression going on. People in the rural communities were just trying to find those creativity experiences. They wanted places of lifelong learning. They wanted to experience worship services together as a community. They wanted to come together as a community. And so as this movement spread, the movement went into the most rural communities, those communities in the United States that are only 200 people uh, large or 700 people, just the corners, not in the big cities yet. The Chautauqua movement centered around four areas, creativity in the arts, 
religion and spiritual growth, education and lifelong learning, and recreation and wellness. And the movement was really uh, centered around adult education, but it also brought together multiple generations. Children experienced this, youth experienced the Chautauqua, as well as adults and seniors. So all people were experiencing this lifelong learning essence as it spread across the United States. Chautauqua communities sprung up. They built auditoriums that were that held two to 4,000 people. These wood structures, they built hotels, they leveled land so that people could pitch tents when they traveled in to experience these lifelong learning lectures and creativity and the live arts. And so they sprung up across in Ohio, Maine, New York, Michigan, Florida, all the way to Texas and out into Colorado. The second type of Chautauqua are the circuit Chautauquas. Now these were a neat concept. They loaded tents on the train. They loaded pastors, uh, professors, politicians, and teachers to go out into these communities to really develop uh, lifelong learning experiences for rural uh, America. Can you imagine jumping on board a train and going out to these small communities and just experiencing uh, the, the Midwest and uh, the, the communities across the United States. I think that would be kind of fun. Chautauqua is a community builder experience. Chautauqua invited civil discourse and discussion amongst communities across North America. Chautauqua encouraged lifelong learning. And Chautauqua challenged our thinking, challenged what we knew, gave us new concepts. And Chautauqua enriched the souls of people across the United States. And at the height of the Chautauqua movement in the United States, it is believed that more than half the population experienced some sort of Chautauqua, either went to a Chautauqua or the Chautauqua came to their town. Now I'm a marketing person and that's pretty phenomenal to me. Wow, uh, I'm just fascinated at how this movement grew across the, across North America and Canada. Like uh, shared earlier, um, Theodore Roosevelt experienced Chautauqua too. And he said, it is the most American thing. Now I thought apple pie was American or hamburgers were American, but this Chautauqua experience was something unique, something unique like Buildum is unique. It was a unique experience that brought people to, together. Today, there are more than 19 Chautauquas across the United States still thriving. There's also hundreds of Chautauqua experiences that community colleges set up, schools and community organizations, humanities councils. It is still alive and thriving um, today. As well, I'll give you an example. Lakeside Chautauqua in Ohio welcomes 100,000 people to their grounds each summer, putting on 75 live performances, hundreds of lectures that people can experience, opportunities for discussions and civil discourse, sitting on front porches, and well-known pastors and religious thinkers and spiritual directors from all over the country. Imagine really coming together as a community to experience all of those lifelong learning pieces. Chautauqua and Bildum need to thrive today. I believe that wholeheartedly. People today are looking for lifelong learning opportunities. They're looking and seeking out for those opportunities to experience the live arts so that they, their souls can become creative. They're looking for opportunities to have that civil discourse and discussions. They just sometimes can't articulate Bildung or Chautauqua. I believe that this movement needs to thrive, whether we're connected to Bildung or Chautauqua, lifelong learning is vital. I wanna invite you, next time you're in North America, head to a Chautauqua. You can visit www.chautauquatrail.org to find all of the communities across the United States and Canada 
and learn more a little bit more. Thanks for heading on this journey with me on the Chautauqua Trail. Gretchen, thank you so much. Uh, I'm signed up. Could you please put the URL in the chat? That would be amazing. Yeah. And I was thinking, you know, with the, the big agenda that Biden uh, came up with in terms of healing of a nation, it sounds like you might hold some of those answers as well in these communities. So let's take uh, 30 seconds for your own reflection. 30 seconds are over. And Gretchen, if you want to read some of the comments in the chat, um, people are very touched. So let me come to our next uh, speaker, Stirla Bierkaka. And Stirla has a university degree in ped ped pedagogy. I can always not pronounce that word in English, in adult education, sociology, and social science, and has written several books and articles about adult learning. He has also held a number of key positions connected to building, and honestly, that list is so long, just read it on the web page. I, I, I'm not going to name them all here. And Stella will describe the history and the present of the Nordic Study Circle Method. Welcome, Stella. Thank you, Nadia. Um, I have a presentation to, to uh, share, so I'll try to share the screen now. I have to admit that uh, both Comenius, Grundtvig, and uh, Fatakwa has been a great inspiration for me during my lifelong journey in adult education. But now, study circles. And uh, to talk about study circles history in uh, eight minutes, it's impossible, but I have to start. So, um, First, we have to understand the, the change from the top down to the bottom up uh, approach to learning. In the Nordic countries, especially in the Nordic countries, we talked about the people need enlightenment. That was just the first thing we said uh, in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, we created in Norway the workers' academies. It was a, an academy not by the workers, but for the workers. The folk university, university extension movements, the popular academies, and as Lena talk about also the folk high schools in this. In this um, but then from 1890, as Lena said, the, the industrial revolution came late to the Nordic countries. Then we got the uh, more bottom-up approach uh, when uh, where the labor, mark, uh, labor union and uh, the labor uh, movement said the, the emancipation of the liberation of the working class should be a task for the workers themselves. It was said education by, not, not for the people, but by the people. And that's why the study circle became the democratic and emancipatory methods for learning in this, uh, in this area. And uh, as uh, Comenius is a person and Grundtvig is a person, the fathers of uh, Bildung, also the study circle has his father of Bildung, which is uh, uh, Oskar Olsson, a Swede. He worked in the Lund branch of the temperance movement, south of Sweden. He was a social democrat. He also was a member of the parliament in Sweden. And he started the first ever uh, study circle, at least what was called the study circle in Lund in, in uh, 1902. And uh, Oscar also said that uh, the study circle should be a group of equals and the leader should be the primus inter pares not the teacher necessarily, but the primus inter pares. Um, and uh, he said that uh, a study circle should be a circle of friends coming together to discuss problems or subjects of common interest. For instance, the temperance challenges, which was um, a challenge also at that time in the beginning of the century. He put up also on some pedagogical, pedagogical principles for participation in study circle. It should be based on equality and democracy, on liberation of resources, of co cooperation and companionship, study and liberty, active participation, and self-managed and self-directed learning. It also came to Norway and uh, in the first annual report from the Workers' Educational Association in Norway, which was founded in 1931, so the first annual report came in 1932, they said the study circle is today the most typical learning tool for the workers' education. It's free, 
is a free way of working has made it most suitable tool for the work of popular enlightenment Bildung. It does not have the rigidity of the eve evening class, nor does it have the image of school, nor the passive passivity of the lecturer, nor the ineffectiveness of the discussion club. It's a combination of all this, uh, of all this uh, cases. And uh, this is a typical study circle sitting around. Uh, you could call it a study group. You could call it a working group. You could call it a group work during a conference. But as a study circle, it is a bit more organized. The concept of the study circle, according to uh, Oskar Olsson, was that people should study in small groups. Five to 15 persons is the best group sizes of a study circle. Eight to nine, maybe it's the is the peak. They often study at home because they didn't have any other places to go or community houses, people's houses. Study material was rare. One circle could have just one book. And that is also the core of a study circle that uh, they share the study material and they, they circulated the book among them. So one participant can read one chapter and report from that chapter at the next meeting of the study circle. And uh, the next chapter could be read by another participant of the study circle. Learning and dialogue was based on the living word, like Grundtvig said, teachers was not necessary when you organized it by this uh, way, but occasionally you could need a teacher. You could also attend lectures and you could collect resources from outside. But most, but, but first and foremost, the, it was based on the experience in the group, the knowledge, learning by sharing experience and uh, the knowledge. It was also important to call the members, circle members or participants, not students, not pupils. Call them circle leaders not teachers. We call them circles, groups, not classes and lessons because previous humiliation or bad experience from school should not frighten people to take part. Of course, when you don't have a teacher, the role of the, te of the leader is crucial. He or she should have both most he at that time, Oscar Olson's time should have with both organize should have both organizational, social and emotional skills, said Oscar Olson. Because you could uh, quote Lao Tse in this, a leader is best when he barely knows he exists, not so good when he when we obey and acclaim him, worst when we despite him. But a good leader who do not talk so much when his work is done or his aim fulfilled, we would say we did it ourselves. And that is the core of the study circle learnings activity too. I'm coming to the end. It's two ways today to organize a study circle. It's from inside or from outside. Most real and genuine study circles are organized from inside. It could be members of a trade union. It could be a group in a local community, friends with shared interest, any subject. It's slightly organized, it's informal, and uh, you don't necessarily gain any public support when the study circles are organized in this informal way. It could also be organized from outside. And th this is a situation, for instance, in Sweden, it's an open invitation. It's an adult education provider, for instance, a study association, which uh, is behind it. It launched in, a, in study catalogs or the internet. It could be, of course, any subject. This is organized learning, but it is non-formal and organized in a special way, according to the act of adult education in Norway, for instance, study circles like this uh, also gain study again, public support. 
<laughs> I will not describe this picture, but I will send it to you afterwards. This is a study circle in one picture. Input, knowledge and experience, outcome, new, new knowledge, skills and attitudes. This is a good study circle, thank you. Stola, thank you so much. Um, well, I, I bet everybody is uh, very inspired now to set up your own study circle based on, on your description. So let's take 30 seconds to just uh, come to our own thoughts. Okay, so the 30 seconds are up. And uh, what Sturala uh, shared with us is actually a wonderful segue into, let's call it a giant study circle, which is going to be introduced by our next guest, Michiel Tolman. And Michiel has initiated and is still expanding the Bildung Academy in Amsterdam as a director, as a consultant, educational developer, teacher, and coach. And his dream is that for any individual community and organization to have access to Bildung in the future. So Michiel will speak about the roots and the future of the Bildung Academy. Over to you, Michiel. Yes, thanks a lot and good to be here. Good to be back also over the last years. I always, uh, um, and with a lot of joy, uh, um, joined this type of meetings with uh, our European friends and colleagues and also now from all over the world, which is great to see. Uh, so happy to be here. Uh, tuning in from Amsterdam. Uh, rainy Amsterdam today and um, today I want to share a little bit in the minutes that I have about the initial feeling which uh, we and myself had before creating the Building Academy and I want to share a little bit about the process and then uh, I, I will show you two different programs which I also link further. Um, and then tomorrow morning uh, there is a workshop for my site which dives more into the different challenges uh, that you face when you're starting a building initiative in your own particular country or uh, in close cooperation, maybe with other countries and other schools or initiatives. Um, so first and for all, uh, my own feeling regarding higher education. Um, well, I had always the idea that I was alone in this, in this, in this feeling and, and this feeling creeped almost immediately upon me that after the introduction week at the university, which was for me in uh, 2009, we jumped into the, the regular colleges and regular classes. And I immediately had the idea that we were not getting to the essence, um, that it was just about a certain way of abstract thinking, which is nice, of course, to learn and which is nice to have, which also brought me a lot, but never really touched me. Um, so my studies was international relations, um, but we never talked about how we would resolve a conflict ourselves in our personal lives or how you can look upon conflicts yourself. Or um, if we had um, a course like um, the philosophy of science, uh, we never went to the point that we asked ourselves what are our personal biases and, um, and what are the temptations that we have in our lives. This really struck me, this, this complete um, neglect of uh, the person and, of course, of my fellow students, but also the teacher as a human being. And secondly, the more, I would say, socialized aspect, the connection with real issues in society and working on them, and the aspect of how we are shaped by our history or um, um, our roots, as was mentioned before also today and um, how this socialization influences us and how we in turn can also partly shape the social structures and culture around us. So I was, I was amazed by this, that those two elements were not present in, in education, at least in the Netherlands in higher education. Um, and um, 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 I agreed with it at first. So I just did my studies. I managed to find out what my teachers wanted to know from me on the, on the, on the exams. And I managed to have like a nice average grade throughout my whole studies. But still, it, it didn't felt right. And I also had, had this urge of and, and, and that a transition is needed, which I really felt in myself, but I couldn't express very well in words and couldn't make clear. 
Um, of course, um, um, uh, I was not the only one. So during my studies, I found out that more people had the same feelings and the same um, struggles with expressing it. Uh, and um, um, after I did my uh, uh, first um, um, uh, steps in on the on the uh, on the career ladder, uh, as to say, I realized, okay, this thing about education uh, will not get away from me. I need to do something about it. This was 2014, and in the winter of 2014, I gathered with one of my previous teachers, with um, uh, which completely agreed with me, and I agreed with him. So in the bar where we met, we made our first um, uh, program. Uh, we didn't have the concept building then yet that clear, but our first building program. So we wrote it down on a, on a servette. I don't know how you say it in, uh, in English, what's the correct word, but on a little note, which was in the bar. Uh, and that was the first idea of our first program. Um, the second thing we did was that we immediately called the next day all people around us in our network, whether it's fellow teachers or students uh, or ex-students, um, to invite them to share their own experiences with education and their own ideas about how education could look like, um, at least education for people between 18 years old and 30 years old. And, and, and throughout uh, and a multitude of sessions, we kind of design thinking like and, and, and developed our first building program, which started in um, September 2015 with uh, exactly 25 students, which was great, of course, because we managed to go from this, this fake feeling, at least I from this fake feeling to a concept, to realizing the concept in reality, finding enough um, and, 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 and students who joined the program, which was great and which was also meant for students from uh, university at first and, and students between 18 and 25 years old. Well, um, fast forward, where are we now? I'd like to share three different um, and, 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 and links with you. I will start with sharing my screen. Um, okay, here you see a picture. And this is a nice picture because um, it's the in September 2015 taken and the lady in white is the Dutch Minister of Education, uh, which we uh, managed to, 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 to get at our opening of our little academy. Uh, the opening we did in the big University of Amsterdam one week before the University of Amsterdam had its academic opening. So we made a nice statement of the importance of building there. And uh, the lady in blue next to her is the rector Magnificus of the UVA. And down there, you can see me with this uh, yeah, red kind of blouse and then and, yeah, the brownish shirt, gray shirt around it, me without a beard here. Um, well, where are we now? Of course, 2015, we uh, made this program and our mission has always been not to just give a nice program for the selected few, but our mission has always been to um, and, 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 and being able for anybody who wants to follow a certain building program. Um, so we did this by starting collaborations with different other universities and local governments. It was very, very difficult to achieve that way of working in cooperation, which I will talk about in the workshop tomorrow. But here's one of the programs. This is for the uh, free university. Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam, as you can see above, we developed a program, it's called Broader Mind, which is accessible to all bachelor students of the VU. The VU has 16,000 bachelor students, and which is now being followed by 500 bachelor students, interdisciplinary courses, focusing on personal development, academic exploration, involvement with complex society, social challenges. Um, so great, and we're very happy with this, and we're going to <clears throat> develop this program further. It's also a part of the strategic agenda of the VU. The VU has a little bit of a problem with the uh, concept building uh, because of some uh, reasons they have. Um, but for us, broader mind building, we can live with it. And secondly, what I want to show, sadly in Dutch, but still nice to show, is a program we developed for the Gemeente. It's called Ambassadors of Amsterdam. Um, we developed it together with Gemeente and two other partners here in the city, which focuses on the building of um, students throughout all different types of studies. So from very practical studies to university, 
which is a program around personal development and uh, formulating challenges in the neighborhoods, in the city, and trying to um, um, solve those challenges with a, a well, diverse group. So where are we now? <clears throat> we, we are trying to um, um, work on our mission. So make building accessible step-by-step step more here in the Netherlands. And um, for us, it would be great. And I would love to work together all around Europe, uh, trying to make building more accessible for uh, all citizens in the end. Um, and that was very great uh, to hear the introduction of uh, Zacharia Stein also in the beginning, where he referred also to Comenius and then later also Humboldt, who both said that um, the institutions should uh, foster a, 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 a context in which people can develop according to their capacity, to their fullest potential. And I think that's, that's a beautiful essence. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing. Mihir, thank you so much. Yes, and as somebody already wrote, this is very impressive. So it just goes to show what you can do with a big vision and a big heart. So let's take 30 seconds to do our own reflection. Our reflection time is up and I'm going straight to our next uh, speaker and guest, Vesa Mati Lati. Vesa Mati is a senior expert in the Foresight team of CITRA and CITRA is Finland's fund for the future. And he leads uh, CITRA's Bildung Plus project, has written several books and has worked in the European Commission, the Academy of Finland, and as a journalist. And Vesa Mati will talk about how CITRA is ready to match today's challenges through Bildung. So welcome, Vesa Mati. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to all. all. I, I will uh, give you a, a short introduction to, to CITRA. And, and uh, our uh, Building Plus project. I will try now to share my screen. I, I have some slides. So um, 54 years ago, when Finland celebrated its uh, 50th birthday, uh, the <coughs> parliament of Finland gave a present to Finland, to all Finns. It, it founded Citra and gave the seed capital uh, to Citra. CITRA has since developed from RD founder, uh, funder to societal change agent. It is now the future house of Finland. And, uh, and we don't use any tax money anymore because we are now funded basically only by returns on endowment capital. CITRA's vision is following. Finland will prosper by building a fair, sustainable and inspiring future that ensures people's well-being within the limits of the planetary boundaries. And around our vision, um, CITRA's activities are divided to five different parts. Uh, in, in this picture on the circle, green, light blue and yellow uh, themes, which are CITRA's focus areas uh, at the moment. So fair data, economy, sustainability, solutions, democracy and engagement. And, uh, and dark blue and faded red are CITRA's permanent activities, foresight and societal training. And under the five parts are CITRA's different projects. As you can see, Building Plus is one of these projects and we work under the foresight and inside department. But uh, one should notice that uh, uh, Building Plus is the smallest one of CITRA's projects. We have, uh, we have a smallest budget and, and only three uh, employees uh, and one assistant. Um, but in spite of our small size, uh, we have been, at least in my opinion, a successful project. And uh, of course, one could argue that the whole CITRA is based on the building ideal. Uh, maybe I should also mention that in Finland, we have, of course, the ordinary building organizations, folk high schools, adult education organizations, etc., like in other Nordic countries. But uh, CITRA is extra on top of those other organizations. Uh, it's a quite special public organization, future house, even, even globally. And a quick look at the numbers, uh, just that you know uh, our size. Uh, our annual budget is uh, a bit under 30 million euros. 
but uh, building plus uh, well our annual budget is maximum 280,000 euros annually and the citra totally has uh, 170 employees uh, then to the building plus project uh, two and a half year project uh, and and um, and uh, in, in Finnish building is Sivistus. Uh, Sivistus is not exactly the same thing as Bildung. Uh, Sivistus uh, has a even wider con uh, is, is even wider concept, but uh, Bildung is still the best translation, even into English. Uh, and, and this picture tries to show that uh, we want to fresh and energize the Bildung ideal. Um, the origins of Building Plus project are in Citra's foresight work. As I told earlier, Citra is the future house of Finland. We, we run projects uh, so that all try to ensure a more sustainable future. About every second year, Citra, Citra's foresight department publishes a list of megatrends. In the current list, uh, the number one megatrend, the most important one and in the center of this picture, is following. Ecological reconstruction is a matter of urgency. So in other words, we want to be in the business of societal transformation, which can be called ecological reconstruction. And if we want to do this, we must ask the question, how do we foster that transformation? Well, we need to act on three levels. One, on practical level, for example, behavior change. Two, on structural level and three on the level of beliefs, values and ideas, for example, the building idea. And one should remember that the scope of outcome is in the end largest on, on the outermost level. So when we work with values and ideas, if we forget the outermost circle, we won't reach lasting results. That is the reason uh, we need projects like Build Plus, which focus on the outermost circle. Uh, there are many dimensions of cities to so or build them, but at least in our project, these in this picture are the main dimensions. So we have intellectual knowledge based building, where the main question is uh, what should we know and what kind of skills we need? So, strong connection to education and learning. Then we have the ethical building, where the main question is how should we act? Strong connection to ethics. And finally, we have societal building, where the question is how do we participate or how do we build a society where everybody can participate? These dimensions and questions uh, connected to them are stable and they have been around for a long time. But the answers differ. Every era has its own answers. We should not be stuck to yesterday's answers because the challenges at the bottom in this picture are today different than they were 100 years ago or even 20 years ago. The other important thing is to have a balance on, on, on these dimensions. At least in Finland in recent years, there has been a lot of activities on lifelong learning, mostly to update worker skills in order to make them maybe more productive. There, I think, is some unbalance. Ethical building and, and societal building have been neglected. And quickly, the aims uh, of Building Plus. Uh, uh, there is three, three aims. Th strengthening the public discussion about building and broadening the narrative of building and supporting new kinds of building activities. And we try to reach our aims by our sub-projects, which are listed in this slide. I'm not going to read through this whole slide. I just highlight a couple of our projects just to give you a taste. We have, for example, a sub-project called Dynamo, which is trying to renew the way museums work. Instead of looking back, the museums could look more to the future and be actors in the cultural transformation for sustainable future. Then we have a sub-project called Future Incubator of Bildung. And that brings together old and established Bildung organizations and fresh new Bildung actors 
that might not even themselves quite realize they work with Bildu to learn from each other. You can learn more about this sub project also in English language because we have just translated and published an article about this project in our web pages. Well, and, and on top of our more practical sub projects, we also produce studies about building issues. But uh, this was in a nutshell uh, the building plus. Thank you very much. In the, in the next slide, you find the uh, web addresses, uh, you find more information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that is also very impressive. Somebody wrote in the chat, what a beautiful vision, which I think is very true. So let's take 30 seconds to reflect on what you're walking away with after this presentation. Our 30 seconds are up. Thank you so much, Lisa Mati. And I will hand over to Elena Tocilina. Elena is a communication strategies expert, a facilitator of group dynamics and business development consultant, and has contributed to a number of Ukraine-wide projects and is now active in the Bildung Group of Ukraine. And Elena will talk about the Ukrainian Bildung Initiative and its role in the deep social transformation of the Ukraine. Welcome, Elena. Thank you, Nadia. Um, I will start with um, telling you that I've been working with um, social transformation in the field of energy efficiency and alternative energy. And I worked closely for about eight years with a Swedish consultant from um, Swedish Export Credit Corporation and Vattenfall. And uh, we've been visiting so many companies in Ukraine. And um, I saw that um, what we were trying to bring out through those energy efficiency um, techniques was perceived uh, so differently in Ukraine. Some would uh, consume the idea and start implementing, and the others would um, reject and would try to find some other ways on how to move on with their business. And my Swedish colleagues would not understand why it's not working here like it's working in their country and we had to deal a lot with trying to find a better way to explain why it's a good way forward and uh, after many years i received the answer why it's not it wasn't working because the mentality was different and the background was different and uh, i will tell you in my little presentation how i got to know a group of people who are working on changing Ukraine and building a society of well-being. But firstly, I would like to, oh my goodness, okay, it's not working. Uh -huh. I hope you can see my presentation. Um, we called our presentation and the approach the emergence, which is about uh, having something emerge from the roots, from the ground, from the earth and uh, being built uh, organically, not um, superficially. And this is what we are trying to do in Ukraine. So as uh, we discussed earlier today, we need to look into our roots in order to build something new. So our little initiative group looked into the roots of uh, Bildung or enlightenment in Ukraine and we found this organization which was called Prasvita, which is uh, the term as it, it is explained, it is so close to Bildung. So in the 19th century, the intelligentsia, the, the people from the elite society, the educated people uh, launched an organization established in Lviv, which was uh, aiming to create a reading circles, libraries and uh, uh, study circles among peasants, among in the towns and the villages, and uh, they were crowdfunding it. And I find interesting uh, the quotation from one of the organizers of uh, this organization, let's make ourselves a conscious people. So their aim was uh, to ground themselves in the national, cultural, historical uh, aspects and uh, to bring out the education for um, for everyone. Yet uh, this initiative was killed by the communists uh, in 1936. 
Uh, and this brings me to another slide, um, which um, is the background which we have and with which we need to work here in Ukraine. Of course, we cannot deny the, the effect and the influence of the Soviet Union, which kind of um, washed out all those initiatives and uh, brought out a different uh, kind of uh, perspective for for the majority of the society which uh, still persists here in ukraine and i'm speaking of the paternalism as the main approach to building a society of course there was the lack of freedom and uh, which was all of that resulted in a very low level of responsibility as if uh, the responsibility was alienated to another um persons to to the society to the government as such and what do we have in the result we have a very immature citizens um and um in 1991 when ukraine became a country again an independent country uh, we had uh, all kinds of events which were leading to the picture in which we live right now, and uh, I would call it a defragmentated society, society which was defragmentated because uh, some of the uh, social political um, structures uh, are still rooted in the Soviet Union, which I have just described the paternalism being the main structure and uh, something new is is emerging and. Um, um, of course, the revolution of dignity uh, was something which brought out the public society and the new kind of thinking uh, to Ukraine. But then um, we, we never dealt with uh, these guys, with these issues, which were the core uh, business elite uh, coming from the early 90s and uh, uh, who uh, created their corporate governance approach, meaning that uh, these um, the laws, the legislation is made in the favor of the oligarchs and uh, not built on the um, normal societal uh, approaches. And uh, I have no idea how I can move this. Um, um, oh, finally, okay. And here you can see two pictures of our president and you cannot kind of discern where's the movie or where's the reality. Um, but I will tell you, the upper photo is a picture like a snapshot from a movie which was called The Servant of the People, which was um, shown for about three to five years. Uh, and then the election happened. And uh, then uh, on the lower photo, it's the photo of the actual president. The same person uh, being an artist and then becoming a president. That speaks for itself, I guess. Um, and uh, just uh, to mention a few other things uh, from this defragmentation, it's uh, the long uh, division of the East and West, which was broadcasted through all kinds of propaganda on the TV. Uh, then if we are talking about the four powers in the society, they all belong to this or that ol oligarchic clan. Uh, and uh, ordinary people who watch TV channels would not have another picture in their minds because uh, everything they see, everything which is coming from the TV channels is coming from the oligarchic elite. So there is no chance to be educated uh, in, in, in a different way. And of course, there is a very low level of trust uh, due to the Soviet background, due to the corruption, uh, high level of corruption, uh, which has become a, a ridicule for, for the society. So it's laughed at, but it's not thought of as something that can be stopped. Yet, we have a new Ukraine emerging, and these three bright pictures show you the Promprilat renovation, uh, an old factory which was renovated by crowdfunding by a social entrepreneur uh, and turned into a modern business office uh, with all kinds of beautiful areas. Uh, and here, this picture with uh, the uh, Azov Sea and uh, with those lakes, 
uh, it's a, a public uh, organization which uh, uh, called Ukrainer, which helped uh, Ukrainians to know all the wonderful touristic uh, and natural places in Ukraine, which has not been happening before 2014. And then you can see Unit City, which was created by a very wealthy man, but uh, it, it's a new approach that, that new businessmen are uh, innovating now in Ukraine, creating places where startups can grow, where people can get educated and not just uh, thinking about income and stuff. So our initiative group is um, having this goal of uh, actualization of the society, of teaching uh, social and political organization that this uh, approach will be the main uh, point on the agenda of the future folk high schools that we will be creating. And uh, basically, we are striving at uh, social transformation for a better future. Uh, just to name a few um, moments from our sh very short history of building in Ukraine, um, I, I need to uh, name our leaders. That's uh, Sergei Chumachenko. He's the researcher, and with his trip to Sweden, all of this initiative started. And he was joined by Anastasia Nikrasova and Mikhail Krikunov, who all together started developing building concept in Ukraine. Um, Thomas Bjorkman, who I saw today on our webinar, um, brought um, uh, the the uh, emerge initiative to Ukraine 2019, and this is where I'm at uh, the group. And uh, as of now, we are developing the concept of building of Ukraine, and uh, we uh, launched uh, a building library for Ukraine and uh, all kinds of communication activities. But the main thing is that the first pilot school is going to be launched, hopefully this year, uh, because the Chumachenko family, Sergei Chumachenko family, purchased this nice building, which you can see on the left. Uh, it's an actual school, um, I think, from the late 19th, early 20th century. It has two buildings, one stone building and one um, timber building. And, uh, it, of course, it needs renovation, but uh, the beginning is there. Another happy news is that uh, the Nordic Secret was translated into Ukrainian um, and published by Nash Format. Uh, this, also, this is also the initiative of building in Ukraine. And you see that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the actual uh, representation on the cover page was changed into a monument, a statue of a human representing a human who is kind of building himself. Yeah, this is for the Ukrainian Library of Bildung, and this is our web uh, Facebook page. And uh, yeah, and we decided to explain to the audience that uh, what building is, because building sounds weird in Ukrainian. It's not a building. It's So we thought, OK, we're not going to invent anything. You will go with Bildung. So we said that this is an approach for developing adults, which was used by the Scandinavian countries to achieve the current level of well-being. And this is where Ukraine is striving at. We are planning to uh, register our own public organization in May, which will be called Ukrainian Building Network, and uh, register the charter for the first public folk high school. And in autumn, we will have the first Ukrainian conference, uh, which will cover theoretical and practical aspects of building, and we will invite our Scandinavian colleagues there. And uh, this is what Ukraine, uh, building in Ukraine needs. Um, yeah, of course, financing and all kinds of uh, contacting with uh, folk high schools associations in Scandinavian countries. We will be thanking you very much uh, if you can support us with any of this. Thank you. Um, Elena, thank you so much. Um, yeah, well, it is also quite humbling to see what needs to happen, what can happen in political environments that are less friendly to initiatives like this than what many of us are used to and have taken for granted. So thank you for sharing that.